Hello and welcome to Skitty Animates. I'm Skitty and today I'm going to teach you about animation smears, how they will help add fluidity to your shots, and also just make you a faster animator. So let's get started. A smear is like an animator's cheat sheet for a motion blur. It's used to emphasize an action in a way the audience will believe without actually seeing it. In fact, if you pause an animation on the smear frame, it's probably going to look distorted and ugly. Think of it as an implied action linking the two poses. As a general rule, your poses are much more important than how you transition between them. The poses are what we linger on for the audience to connect with. Smearing just uses this to our advantage. If the audience is only going to feel an action, we no longer have to be worried about things like weight distribution, balance, or feet locking. So now let's talk about how you would actually go about making a smear. Once you have your beginning and end poses done, adding a smear is basically just being playful with your spacing. I'll link to a past tutorial in the description if you need a refresher on spacing and overlap, but for the sake of brevity, spacing refers to the size of the gaps in between poses, which in turn reflects the timing of the action. As you can see here in this example of Mushu from Mulan, we have two arcs of which the action is moving on. We have one tracking his nose and another one tracking what's in his hand. You can also notice that both arcs have a smear on them. Following the blue motion trail which is on his nose, you can see that there's a huge gap between frame 6 and frame 8, so frame 7 is used as their main smear pose. What the smear is doing is bridging the gap between the two points. Without it, the action might feel too snappy. The same can be said about his hand trail, but the gap is large enough that it uses two smear frames on frames 4 and 5. When putting an arc on a character's head, the most important thing to try track is the nose. As you can see in this example, he's doing it perfectly. In traditional animation, there is a lot more freedom to distort or blend features together because they aren't limited by a rig. It's quite common in traditional animation to have a character's eyes drawn as one giant eye blob on a smear frame and other deformities like that. The majority of 3D rigs, we are limited to smearing with squash and stretch type controllers. Be careful with this mindset though. A common misconception about smears is that they are very close to, if not the same, as squash and stretch, but they're actually total opposites. If you were to squish the top of a ball on a ball bounce, you would have to expand the sides in order to keep the object's mass. Smears, on the other hand, is all about breaking that mass for a frame or two to emphasize an impact. For this example, I have two poses of Kayla hitting a punching bag. I'm going to add the most common type of smear for 3D, which is the dragging smear. A dragging smear is when the object moves forward but stretches to leave parts of the object behind. Now before you start doing your posing on your smear, you're going to want to turn on ghosting or onion skin or any other sort of comparable tool depending on your program in order to show your start and end positions while you're posing. So what I've done here is added motion trails on the controls that are the most important to track for the arcs. So we have a small one down here for the hip control, we have a wide one here for the wrist, we have another small one here for the elbow to show how far back it's going to go, and I also have one here on the nose because it's very important to see if the head's doing anything a little janky. The great thing about motion trails is that if you scrub through the time slider, you can see it's changing color to show you where that frame lands on the trail. So I have our key poses here on frame 10 and on frame 13, and the biggest gap here in the spacing is between frame 11 and 12, which makes me think that the smear frame should be on frame 11, because we're gonna use the smear to bridge that gap. But before we do anything to smooth that out, the first thing that I need to do is adjust the hips because the hips are currently moving in a straight line followed by a straight line. And if I smooth that out after I work on the arm, then everything that we did for the arm is going to have to be tweaked again later. So this is just to save us from counter animating later. With this pose shift, the things that are moving the most would be both of her arms and also her head. So those are the only things that I think I'm going to smear for this example, and the rest can just be animated normally with an antic overshoot and a settle. Unless she was zipping all the way across the screen, I don't think that every control would look good with a smear on it. So I'm going to turn off the face cam for now and just dive right into it. So while I'm working on these poses, I just wanted to go over a couple things just to make it a little more clear. 
The most important thing to think about while posing a smear is that it follows the arc of the action. I can't stress this enough. Your smear should not break the arc. If your smear fishtails outside of the action arc, it won't read as anything other than janky. You have to remember that because these things won't be seen and only felt, they have to be smooth more so than anything else that you've done. Now, if you wanted the hands to follow a different arc than the head or something along those lines, then that's okay. You can add multiple arcs. Just make sure that the arcs complement each other. And what I mean by that is ask yourself if both arcs are easily readable or if they get in each other's way. Again, just don't forget how fast these frames go by and try not to add too much information that the viewer can't pick up on in that short amount of time. With the punching example, the part that's doing the bulk of the work is the punching arm. So that's the one that we want to emphasize and put the biggest smear on. That will in turn draw the viewer's focus. I'm going to add a small smear on the other arm just because it's also moving quite a bit of a distance. And I'm also gonna put one on the head because it's complementary to the arm. But the rest of her body is just going to be animated normally. And with animating these smears, we're going to be breaking the geometry quite a bit to fill that gap between the two poses. But we also wanna make sure that the start and end positions are like a cap on the smear. You don't wanna break the silhouette of the two poses and extend the arm outside of those realms. For instance, if I took her punching arm and made it go past where the ending position would be, it would look like she breaks her arm and then pushes back. When her arm is drawn back, we're going to use the elbows position as the cap for that side, and with the end position, we're going to use her hand as the cap for that side of the smear. For the sake of a punch though, I'm not going to have the hand reach the destination before the rest of the arm, because then it would look a little bit noodly. We still want the arm to feel like it's moving at a constant rate with itself, other than the arm reaching there before the elbow, though that is a technique you could use if it's a character moving across a screen or something like that. I didn't realize until diving into it that Kayla doesn't have any real controls for stretching the arms, but that's okay. As long as it looks fine in your camera view, use whatever controls you have. For this animation, I ended up breaking her forearm pretty bad. I also scaled up her arm and hand to add to the motion blur effect and stretched out the fingers on the punching hand. For her head, I dragged it backwards and scaled its width, and for her back hand, I simply elongated the fingers and pointed them towards the starting position. We also want to make sure that we add a cushion on each end of the smear, so your typical antic overshoot and or settle will still apply, because what we're really doing is showing the audience this is where the character starts, this is where the character ends, and we're just going to pretend that they went between the two spots. In order for that to read like a complete action, we really need to emphasize the beginning of the pose and the end of the pose. If you think of the example of a character about to run off screen, a lot of the time in old cartoons, you will see that the character really winds up for a really exaggerated antic before shooting across the screen in one or two frames. That was that animation's cushion to make it more believable. If you don't add the settle after the character's action, it will feel like the character slipped slammed into a brick wall, or got hit by a bus. Morbid, I know, but it's just as jarring. You can also play with varying the intensity of your smear. If the head doesn't travel as far as the arms, but it's still enough of a gap that you should probably fill that space, then you can try just putting a smaller smear on the head than you do on the arm. If the arm is moving more distance, then it probably warrants having more focus on it anyway, so the bigger smear there will make it better. And now, for the finished animation. So as you can see here, we have our big antic wind up and then our smear and also a recoil at the end and our settle. Looking at the yellow here, you can see the huge gap that the punching arm makes up with with the smear. You can see the back arm in blue is arcing up and then arcing back down. And in green, you can see that the head arcs back, smears forward and then recoils and settles. This obviously isn't the most polished animation in the world, but it was about 15 minutes for the poses, about 25 minutes to animate the smear and the polish for a total of about 40 minutes of animating. Now I just wanna to touch on another type of smear called multiples or duplicating smear, depending who you're talking to. Multiples is when you smear your poses together by using duplicates of the object or limb. So in a sword swing, you would add multiple swords to that smear frame or in a dramatic 
hand wipe, you could have multiple hands or arms, sometimes referred to as hero arms, but only for that one frame. I also just want to say that when learning how to animate smears, it can be really fun and exciting to implement them, but I just want to warn against using them all the time. A smear shouldn't be used in every shot. Wait for the bigger actions that need a harder impact. Anything that's overused, I mean this applies to animation or not, it loses its meaning and its impact. So it's better just to keep it as an ace card up your sleeve for that right moment. And that's all I'm going to say about smears for now. Leave a comment below if there's something you didn't understand, like and subscribe if you learned something, links to socials are in the description, and remember to always use a reference.